<laughs> the largest pork producer in the United States of America is Chinese owned. Basically, Chekhov is we're paying to fight ourselves. Or uh, paying to destroy our own industry. We're the packer that will own the birds and buy the feed for the birds and tell the farmer how to feed the birds and it controls everything from the egg clear up to the plate. When the USDA's own data shows that the average return to feeding cattle in America is a negative $24 per head per month for the past 23 years. We're reaching the point of no return um, yes. when it's game over. I'm talking to CEO of RCAF USA, Bill Bullard, and we're discussing the demise of our American system and way of life. When we refer to packers in this video, we're referring to the four large meat packers that control 85% of the industry, which is basically, which means technically a monopoly. And those companies are JBS, Cargill, Marfrig, and Tyson. We're at a, a tough point because we've, we're losing so many small farms and ranchers, and yet we have to change it back, even if we were to start today and go, we could change anything we wanted overnight and change these rules to apply back competition, it's gonna take a lot of time and money and effort to, to change the industry back to where it's competitive and works a little <clears throat> bit more even playing field, isn't it? Well, it, and we're reaching the point of no return. Um, yes. When it's game over. And if you look at our sister industry, the hog industry, for example, uh, four decades ago, there were over 600,000 independent hog producers scattered all across America. Uh, today, we wiped out nine out of every 10 of them. Now we're wow. down to 60,000. And so there's an industry that is now vertically integrated. Uh, so vertically integrated means? Means that the, the meat packer owns the entire supply chain for the for the. So he owns, he owns where, they're, where they grow the can, or grow, where they grow the hogs, where they butcher the hogs, where they sell the hogs, where they butcher the hogs all the way up to the right. retailer. And the, 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 the largest pork producer in the United States of America is Chinese owned, Smithfield Farms. Really? Uh, which should be alarming to consumers It should be alarming, well. yes. 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 And the first thing that happened was they lost their cash market, was that the meat packers were offering the same kind of contracts that were seen in the cattle industry, and they did that in the hog industry, and they, they shrunk the cash market to where it became so thin it could no longer establish a competitive price for hogs. And so producers had nowhere to go to sell their hogs unless they had a contract with a packer. Mm. And so that's why we lost nine out of every 10 producers. And for them, it's game over. Uh, mm -hmm. We're not gonna reverse that hog industry uh, because it has become so vertically integrated and concentrated and controlled. Um, but what we can do is prevent that from happening to the cattle industry. And look at the poultry industry. You know, that is even more uh, vertically controlled than is the hog industry because in the poultry industry, typically it's the integrator or the packer that will own the birds and buy the feed for the birds and tell the farmer how to feed the birds and it controls everything from the egg clear up to the plate. So it's not even an independent person raising chickens anymore for the for, to, to sell that then go to the packer then they go to the retailer. It's actually the basically the packer who is owning the birds That's and he just hires the farmer to use his property. That's correct. See what, what the meat packers realized is that they didn't want to invest in the farms themselves and that they didn't have to uh, pay out the, the capital requirements to buy the farms. Instead they could just own the animals and require the farmer to feed the animals according to their standards. So in essence what you said is absolutely right. The, the meat packer owns the entire production chain, everything but the farm, and that means the farmer's left with the liability and the risk mm -hmm. of land ownership and owning the buildings and equipment and all of that. And, and the meat packer owns all of those um, factors that are profitable. They, they would own the birds, the feed the birds, dictate the production standards, and obviously poultry producers have lost their independence. Oh, totally. They're no longer independent producers. Hog producers have lost their independence. Cattle industry is the last frontier. Um, and, and one of the reasons is, is it was, it's the most difficult industry uh, to capture in terms of corporate control. And the, the, the managerial requirements you know, for calving, um, ask any farmer or rancher setting out in a blizzard, you know, pulling cows mm -hmm. uh, in the spring, 
um, and caring for their animals. And so the, the meat packers don't want to do that. So where they're focused today is not on the farms and ranches. They're focused on where the animals become congregated. And that happens in the feedlot sector. That's the last segment of the live cattle supply chain. And so the meat packers are, are exerting control over the feedlot sector. And that's where we saw, saw such a huge loss in the independent, the family farm size feedlots okay. uh, that are just going by the wayside. We had 113,000 of them back hmm. um, a generation ago. Today we're down to 25,000. Wow. So they're, they're in, once they can kind of totally control that segment, then the next segment down has nowhere to go unless they go through <clears> them. Because <throat> what that means that if, you know, you want to sell your cattle and you want to sell them on time, right? You're going to have to sell them through a feedlot controlled by the food packer, or the, right. the right. meat packer. So the, um, the meat packers are essentially expanding their market power upstream in the supply chain. So the feedlot is the sector that they're focused on now. And uh, we have been trying to reform the policies uh, and the requirements between the feedlot selling cattle to the packer. Uh, we're concerned that the, the, that the packer may be granting preferences to some of these largest feedlot and depriving those same type of preferences to others, uh, which makes them unprofitable. And so we are concerned that the meat packers have been giving preferences to the largest of feedlots that allow them to re remain profitable, even at a time when we saw severely depressed prices in America for independent producers and they started going out of business from 2015 to 2021, before we saw, before this last economic shock drove prices up, uh, we had seriously depressed prices in America. And in fact, the, the latest U.S. Department of Agriculture data shows that from 2020 to 2021, we lost a thousand more independent small family size feedlots. From 21 to 22, we lost another 1,000. And from 22 to 23, yet another 1,000. So in the last three years, we've lost 1,000 of these family, and, and these were contributors, economic contributors to mm -hmm. their rural communities. Um, and, and they were you know, good stewards of the land and good animal um, husband, husband men and women. And we forced them out of business. And we forced them out of business uh, at a time when the largest feedlots were expanding. Mm. So how does that happen? In a competitive industry, how does the largest ones continue to expand um, and the smaller ones go out of business when the USDA's own data shows that the average return to feeding cattle in America is a negative $24 per head per month for the past 23 years? Wow. What that tells us is there must be compensation being paid to the largest feedlots that the Keep smaller that independents down. are not receiving. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, these larger feedlots could not stay in business either. If you're losing, if USDA them, data is correct. If you stay, if that data is correct, that means all of them, no matter right. what feedlot, is losing twenty-four dollars a head. There's no way even a large one can make up for that by volume. And that would be the average per head loss for twenty-three years. Right. You know, how do we still have an industry if that's the case? So there's things going on in this industry that we um, are not yet aware of, though we suspect that there may be bonuses being paid to these largest of feedlots, gotcha. or there may be um, cost plus contracts that they enter into, or the certain financial arrangements, or, or share in the profit, share in the loss. Something is supplementing Something that loss supplementing to make the them make money. If right. the USDA data is correct. If the data right. is correct, right. And I believe it to be so. One last thing, the cattle prices are high right yes. now. So, the, so that means that the farmer and rancher is making more money now than he has, although, although what I'm actually finding out is because they had to cut their herds from the drought, they're not actually making more money. They're just using this as to try to build back up. So they're making about the same right. or even less right. because they have less cattle. Right. But uh, that means everything's good for the farm, the small rancher, right? The price is up. Will it stay there because of where we're at or will that price come back down? Will the price come back down? Well, we can go back in history to the drought that we experienced in 2011 to 13. It drove prices then to the highest nominal levels in history. And uh, expectations were from both government and private analysts alike that cattle prices would remain high for the next three years because of that long biological cycle. It would take three years in order to rebuild the liquidated herd. But instead of waiting three years, 
cattle prices collapsed in 2015 and they fell further and faster than any time in history. And so what we're seeing today is we see these uh, increased prices as we see increased volumes of imports in, in, a, in an attempt to curb uh, the demand for U.S. cattle. And we're going to see um, just more of these um, um, cattle procurement practices that are anti-competitive and that disadvantage the U.S. cattle producer. So at this point, cattle producers um, are able to recover you know, some of the long-term losses because they had depressed prices all mm -hmm. the way from 2015 to 2022. And uh, so, and now we're in this inflationary period where their input costs are the highest in history. Uh, fuel costs, feed costs, uh, everything that they are doing uh, has increased in price. So that is, that is why we continue to see farmers and ranchers going out of business. So one of the things, there are beef organizations or cattle organizations that actually are fighting this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Our CAF USA is fighting it. What about the beef council, the state beef councils? Are they helping this situation? So the, uh, the state beef councils are the, the state entities that collect um, the, the beef checkoff dollars. The government back in 1985 uh, mandated that all producers who sell cattle will have to pay $1 per head beef checkoff fee. That money is collected, it generates about $80 million a year, and the money is supposed to go to promote uh, beef. And uh, that program has not been reformed for the past 35 years, it's antiquated, and th there's two problems with it. Number one, um, it contracts with lobbying organizations. In other words, uh, for example, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association is a lobbying organization and receives about $25 million from uh, the beef checkoff program. And another organization called the U.S. Meat Export Federation uh, is a recipient of these mandatory uh, beef checkoff dollars that the government requires to be paid. And so what is happening here is the two organizations I just mentioned for example, uh, have been fighting us with, uh, for mandatory country of origin labeling. They do not want consumers to know uh, where the beef is produced. Hmm. And both of them helped to repeal country of origin labeling in 2015. And yet cattle producers are forced by the government to actually fund these organizations through their beef checkoff program. So, so basically checkoff is we're paying to fight ourselves. Uh, or uh, paying to destroy our own industry, uh, as some would see it. Hmm. Yeah. Very interesting, because that's something I think a lot of people don't realize is the checkoff dollars are were there to, to actually help, prom well, I guess they are promoting beef in a way. It's just promoting a different different part of the <laughs> industry than, than the actual people who produce the beef, right? That's right. And in fact, another problem with the, with the program is it, it promotes and advertises a generic product, generic beef. That means the U.S. cattle producer is paying into a program that is helping to fund the advertisement for beef that is imported from Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, or any right. one of those 20 countries. And so U.S. cattle producers are forced uh, to help advertise the product of their competitor when they can't even compete with their competitor because Congress repealed country of origin labeling so they cannot distinguish their superior product in the grocery store for consumers. So it's, uh, <laughs> some would call it a mess. Are you totally against importing and exporting? So if we didn't import, we wouldn't eat bananas. Right. Uh, so there's, <laughs> there's a purpose behind imports and uh, imports could help supplement, you know, our domestic supplies. But the, the volume of imports that we're receiving in the cattle industry uh, are sufficient to eliminate opportunities for aspiring ranchers and even uh, e uh, profitable opportunities for current ranchers because those imports are being used as a d direct substitute. Consumers aren't receiving a choice. Uh, they can't tell whether they're buying a product from Uruguay or from the United States. And But when they buy the product from Uruguay, they're not creating any demand for cattle in, in America. And that eliminates opportunities for producers. So. Um, so we, we are not against imports, um, but presently 74% of all the lamb consumed in America is from Australia and New Zealand. It's all imported product. We have decimated our commercial sheep industry and it has been imports that have done it. So we've, we have a petition filed with the U.S. Trade Representative's Office asking for an investigation um, because we want to prove that imports uh, are a, a serious um, have caused serious injury to our domestic sheep industry. Same thing is happening to the cattle industry. 
And so um, it would be nice to afford consumers' choices through imports, and that's how you would do that. But what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to level the playing field so these meat packers cannot continue to source cheaper product and displace the production here in America. The way to do that is with a tool that uh, we have ignored for many, many years, and only recently has it been um, returned, and that is tariffs, using tariffs and tariff rate quotas in order to provide an opportunity for importers to, to access the domestic market until they reach the threshold where it begins to cause injury to our domestic market. And once they hit that threshold, then they should either be, those imports should either be curtailed or uh, there should be a, an exorbitant uh, tariff uh, price that they would have to pay to continue accessing the market. That would prevent them, for example, from being predatory and just trying to capture a share of our, our domestic market. Mm. And so we view the sheep industry as the canary in the coal mine. The cattle industry is the last frontier and uh, in terms of being captured uh, by the processing sector. And so that's why, um, that's why we fight so hard uh, to preserve the independence of the uh, cattle producers and why we are advocating for tariffs on imported cattle, imported beef, uh, imported lamb, and imported uh, mutton. So you're, back to your original question, are we against imports? No. Uh, but we must have a fair playing field for our independent producers so that they can compete on a level playing field with those imports. And they just simply cannot do that uh, given the much lower production costs and the, the much lower production standards uh, that are applied in the uh, livestock husbandry husbandry in, in other countries. The other day I was up at a uh, this lady's ranch up in northern Montana and had a lamb burger for the first time ever. And I don't know, maybe she has some specific thing. It was incredible. It, yeah. it really was. Yeah. And I'm like, why haven't I, why don't we eat sheep anymore? I, you know, I guess older sheep have fat that kind of, you know, is yeah. not good. But sheep are good to eat. I mean, younger sheep anyway. So what is the real answer to this? Uh, there is... I mean, you said there's already laws in the books that prohibit the monopolization of, of companies and, and uh, these mergers that happen. I mean, I just read, I think it was last week, Cargill bought like a whole bunch more companies, correct? So how, what is the real answer to this problem of, of in, the, in the, at least the beef industry, the fact that this is just so centralized? How do we fix it? Well, a um, couple of ways. Number one, Number one, we have to restore competition. <clears throat> and the way to restore competition is to put in the hands of consumers the ability to initiate competitive signals in the marketplace. They do that when they make choices in the marketplace. So if a consumer has a choice between a U.S. steak and a Uruguayan steak, and they choose the U.S. steak, then the demand signal that, that, that is created by their choice is sent into the supply chain and lands at the, the meat packer, and the meat packer can go to one source and one source only to satisfy that demand initiated by the consumer. And that's they the US market. They have to go to the US cattle I producer mm -hmm. to satisfy, to, to replace that inventory that has been purchased. And so we want to put in the hands of consumers, we want to empower them to initiate competition in the cattle industry. And the only way they can do that is if we restore mandatory country of origin labeling for beef. That's why that is so critical. That's the number one thing we need to do. The second thing we need to do is we need to force, even though the packers are highly concentrated, four of them controlling 85% of that fed cattle market, we need them to compete for the domestic cattle that they're purchasing. And rather than compete today, they're using, we call them cattle purchasing tools that insulate them from competition. They enter into contracts um, that, that give the, the cattle seller um, timely access to the market. That's what the cattle seller gets for the contract. The meat packer gets cattle committed to him or her without having to negotiate a price. And so it's a, it's a huge boon for the meat packer because they are able to have uh, hundreds of thousands of cattle committed to them every week mm -hmm. and they don't have to negotiate a price. And yet what they will continue to do though is they'll use the residual cash market where there is a negotiated price determined in the cash market as opposed to the contracts. But the meat packers have devised a way that they go to the cash market to establish the price 
upon that would apply to all of these contracted cattle. So currently the balance is about 80% contracted, 20% cash. So when the meat packers have all of these 80% of their cattle committed every week, and they have only have to rely on the cash market for 20%, um, if they want to lower the price, all they have to do is shun the cash market because that will lower the price of the cash market, which would ultimately lower the price of all of these contracted cattle. So if they can lower the price in the cash market at the, at the sale barn, then they can say, well, that, that price is what we're gonna now pay our contract. That'll be the base price for all of these contracted gotcha. cattle that were committed without ever negotiating price. I don't know what other industry um, you know, has the, this kind of a pricing structure where the producer uh, is willing to, to sell a product simply to have access to the marketplace. But when you have four packers controlling 85% of the marketplace, access, timely access to the market is critical, especially in the cattle industry because it's a perishable product. Mm -hmm. Once an animal reaches slaughter weight, it must be marketed within a, a matter of weeks, otherwise it begins to degrade in quality. Uh, it right. puts on fat instead of muscle. And so um, the, the meat packers have the producer over the barrel and they exploit that. So in 2019, we filed um, a national class action antitrust lawsuit against the big four packers. And in that lawsuit, we allege that the meat packers have unlawfully colluded in order to depress cattle prices paid to cattle producers. Colluded being worked together between the four of them? That's correct. We, okay. We've alleged that they worked the, unlawfully. Collusion is unlawful. Mm -hmm. um, we allege that they have unlawfully colluded to depress prices. Um, and we allege in our lawsuit that the way that they, they did that was that they would reduce their weekly slaughter and they would reduce their purchases in the cash market. And at the same time. Causing cattle to back up. And then we allege that when these cattle backed up, it would incentivize producers to um, jump out of the cash market and jump into these non-competitive contracts, uh, which benefit the packer. And so, but the other part of that lawsuit is, we allege that they have artificially depressed prices paid to producers while simultaneously inflating the price that consumers pay for beef at the grocery store. And so uh, this is a huge antitrust case, it's historic, and it's been going on since 2019, and we're currently in the, the discovery phase, and so it's gonna go on for another few years, I would imagine. Before it'll be heard settled. or settled? Before it'll be settled. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Bill. I really appreciate you taking the time to really walk through a lot of these issues that uh, the small time farms and ranches around this, this wonderful country are dealing with right now and the implications that has for the consumer. So mm -hmm. I appreciate it. My pleasure. And if the consumers want to help, one thing they can do is call their member of Congress and urge them to pass mandatory country of origin labeling for beef in the 2024 Farm Bill that is currently being worked on. And so this is timely. So that's, is it being put in the Farm Bill? We yeah. want it in the Farm Bill. We, we want it in the Farm Bill to want, take this, oh, country of origin labeling, okay. Correct, yep. And what do you do about the, the trying to control everybody with electronic tags, is that? So that's separate from the Farm Bill, but yeah. it, it, we may use the Farm Bill for a vehicle to try to prohibit it. So we're trying to stop it right now um, at, the, at the White House. Okay. And so we'll see what happens there. If we're unsuccessful, we're going to go to Congress because Congress has never authorized the, the USDA to impose this kind of a burden on the cattle industry. USDA has just uh, assumed uh, that level of control over the industry. And so there may be more litigation, but we'll start with Congress first if, if the U.S. Department of Agriculture won't uh, withdraw this on its own. So how do people stay <laughs> updated with what's going on? Can they, um, is it best to watch your stuff on YouTube to find out? Can, is that a continual news, like how you're doing with the, uh, the tags, or is there a website they can go to to just keep track of where it is progressing? Well, they could become a member of our yeah. USA and receive does, our information, and we would provide a Does that get a newsletter or something? Or? Uh, we have a, a quarterly magazine. Quarterly magazine? Yes. Okay. Yep. And in that, you kind of keep keep everybody keep updated on? Keep our members on. updated on all the issues that are um, facing, threatening their industry. <laughs> right. In this case. And that's our... R-C-A-L-F-U-S-A.com. Okay. And so we've got a Facebook page too that we put information out on timely issues. Um, so um, becoming a member and, and monitoring our social media would uh, 
be helpful for consumers and producers alike. Okay, good. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you.